are back once again uh, at the Romford Film Festival doing another little Q&A with the director, the editor, the producer, sang the theme song, th- sang the theme song, wrote the theme song, all that good stuff. And we also have the composer and, sorry, what was your involvement again? Researcher. 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 It's been a long day. It's been a long day. I've, I've come down on the, the train from Berwick, so that was like a four and a half, four and a half, five hour journey, which was, which is why my interview you saw last night wasn't live. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have just screened the documentary, The Langford Tales, which is a fantastically interesting documentary about a lot of like, I think we've all known these little towns and you guys have really delved into a certain era of this town. So let's get into that a little bit. First of all, um, introduce yourselves, tell us what you did, and we will move from there. And my name's uh, Theo Maximilian Gobel, and I'm the editor, producer, director of Langford Towers. Uh, my name's Linda Franklin, and I did the research on Langford Towers. <laughs> My name is uh, Christos Andreu and uh, I am the original music composer of the project. And we'll get to that in a second because, yeah. But, <laughs> so, Langford Tales. Why, why a documentary about this, this little town? I mean, the documentary speaks for itself, but why, why go down this road? Well, it kind of started out, um, I'd say probably the, the first thing that made me put the light bulb in my head was um, actually Linda posting old photographs on Facebook mm-hmm. on a local village group. She'd be posting old photographs of Langford and sort of surrounding areas. And um, whenever people post these, people do it in every town and village of the world, yeah. right? Whenever she would post these photographs, she would inevitably get comments from old Langfordians saying, oh, I remember, that's my grandmother. And I, that was my horse in the 1920s, or I lived in that building or whatever. Yeah. And um, sort of the filmmaker and me sort of just knew that these comments would just be, they get pushed down the timeline. Right, yeah. Things get posted, it it just gets buried. And um, I thought actually, this actually was the the initial thought for Langford Tales, was I just need to, I just need to get these photographs, ask people on camera, Mm. tell me some stories, don't just post on Facebook, tell me. And I just knew that I'd be able to do something. I'd be able to yeah. create, create a good film out of it. Um, you can pretty much create a good film out of anything. <laughs> um, I'm kind of interested in telling stories that nobody else is going to tell. Um, and no one else was going to really yeah. make a film. I say that. Um, <laughs> no one else was going to make this film. So I thought, actually, it's on, it's on me to do it. Mm. Um, a guy actually did make a film about Langford <laughs> in 1984. All oh, right, um, which is quite interesting, um, and it featured Ralph Turner, who I interviewed, uh, the Normandy Beach vet. And did you know that at the time, or I'd I'd watched it. I someone gave me the VHS, and I thought that maybe Google I was that. watching the unedited film because the opening shot lasted for about seven minutes, and it had some. You know, I know you're Scottish, but so excuse me, it sounded like someone was like treading on a bagpipe. It was just a really weird soundtrack. Yeah. And because it was VHS from the 80s, it was all sort of kind of like the tape was a bit saturated and, you know. <laughs> so anyway, amazing that this guy, I tried to contact this guy. Um, he's since left Langford, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I tried to contact him because I thought it'd be really cool to kind yeah. of go and have a beer with him and just say... I've done the same as you, but like 40 years later, mm-hmm. um, never got in contact with him, but uh, yeah. That'd be interesting, that would be very interesting to, to sit down and have a beer and talk, talk about your two separate projects that so, prob- uh, probably step on a lot of the same sort of ground, but completely different era. Yeah. So yeah. there are people making films about their towns, their cities, their, their, their local communities. Um, you know, we, we have just made a community film. Yeah. And that sounds a bit dry, um, but the, the initial idea was let's make a community film, but let's do it in a way so when people watch it, they're like, oh, okay, this is quite emotional. This yeah. is quite engaging. That, that was the 
initial idea based on you know, all the photographs that Linda was posting well, on Facebook? Well, of, of, um, of all the posts and, and all the, the pictures and everything that was being posted, was there any one that kind of just immediately hit you and you thought, you know what, this is going to make a movie, we're going to do a documentary with this? No, it was all to do with the comments. Just it comments? just people saying... I remember one guy in particular said, if you want to get any stories, you need to chat to old Bill, <laughs> such and such yeah. a street. Um, and I didn't know Linda personally at this time, so... Um, yeah, and, uh, and it, I think that's what made my ears prick up. Someone saying, if you want to know more, and they weren't talking to me, they were just saying, spurting it out on Facebook. If you want to know more stories, you've got to chat to this person. Yeah. And that was it. I, I was hooked. I was like, mm, I, need to, I need to go and talk to these people. Didn't know who they were at that point, but um, not everybody wants to be... Yeah, no, I get that, I get that. And, yeah. and, and what was it about that, the, the period, like the, the Second World War sort of period that you were sort of tapping into, those stories more so? What was it about those stories that... I think it's just... Um, you know, the kind of people you want to talk to who can really take you back to a bygone age. I mean, I, I was born in 76, so for me the 60s was just 10 years before I was born. I don't see the 60s as this kind of yeah. really kind of like bygone age. No, no, yeah. You, but the only people alive today who, who can really take you far back, they're usually in their 90s, right? 80, yep. Late 80s, 90s. And that kind of period is their childhood. I wasn't interested in just making a story, a film about, um, you know, guys with silver hair talking about landing on Sword Beach. There's so many of them, and I think the beauty of what we've got with Ralph is we've captured his um, early, early yeah. years. He talks about his grandfather in the 1920s. He would have been around in the sort of, you know, born in 18. 50 maybe you know it's pretty <laughs> we're, amazing we're, go, really, we're going back it makes the hairs stand up yeah. in your arms when you just think about being able to tap Mad, into it? get someone that old talking about being so young <laughs> yeah. but talking about their their parent and everything but um as the researcher as well how did you go about saying right these are the the stories you want to be looking into and these are the like because i imagine there was just hundreds of stories yeah, and I, well, it was used there, wasn't it really? I just gathered the photos, but the main thing was the Rex Swain is what did it for me. Right. Because my mum had got the photo, she died, like all our parents eventually, and leave a box of photos. And one photo had Rex Swain on the back. So I started, and I remember her telling me that how the village felt when he died. Because it was a small village then, wasn't it? It's much bigger now, and they all were, everyone was just, you know, you all cut, everyone knew him. Mm -hmm. And I put that on Facebook, and I think that's what you started asking about then, didn't you? About Rex. Do you know any more about Rex? Can you find out a bit more about? So I started um, looking at the archives on the internet. It's easy now, and you can go into yeah. it all, and I went right in depth into it all. So that's what did it for me, and then you linked it all up, because Ralph knew Rex. When you started talking to Ralph, and Ralph knew who else was, I mean, there was all six of them all went together on the same Sunday. day. And when he started talking, he said, "You won't believe this, but mm -hmm. they knew each other." Wow! And then it just went from there. And I felt then like I knew Rex, like you. We started to get to know him because we found out what he did in the village before he went. And he was just a boy of well, seventeen when he joined the ATC, and then he flew Lancaster bombers. <laughs> Okay, well, not flew them. He was he was tail, tail. What do they call it? Tail end Charlie, which is apparently they that just the survival rate is yeah terrible. Yeah, and I can imagine. I can imagine. The age, you said so young, so young. You couldn't get over how young he was. So that's what started it for me. And then I just said, "Do you want any more help?" <laughs> <laughs> I just kept flooding you with didn't I things from the the uh, newspapers that we found all sorts of reports. Of when he went missing and funeral reports of you know so it's just amazing isn't it, the stories behind the names and, and what would you obviously um there'll be a lot of different stories but what would you say was the most interesting story that you guys found oh god that's difficult to choose isn't it 
<laughs> it's not not for this guy. <laughs> for me, it's got to be it's got to be the fact that Rex never made it back home. Right. His mum didn't know where he was. This would have been in the forties, right? So yeah. She would have just maybe got a telegram or whatever. She she just there's no there's no going on the internet or any of that. Um, and it's a fact that in 1953, Ralph and Malcolm were talking about their old mate Rex. Mm. So what? Ten, ten years. Ten, ten years. Old. Ten years. Ten years. Later, know his mum had ten years of, of like grief, and then they were like, "Oh, do you remember that lady who?" You know, we billeted with in Holland that winter in 1940, whatever. Um, why don't we go over and stay with her and see if we can find Rex's place of rest? And they did, and they took a photo and they brought it back and they, they oh, gave the mum the photo. I mean, I just think, for me, that, yeah. Is, yeah, that is... That's like goosebumps. That's such, a, <laughs> such a tale, it's such a awesome story. And... Um, Ed, Ed, when we were editing the film, it, you were talking about another film here where the guy woke up four in the morning and he was like, I need to move from yeah. the beginning to the end or whatever. I, I had so many oh, nights. Yeah. <laughs> Do I end the film with Rex then going over in 1953 or does that happen yeah. right at the end of the war? It's, it was real tricky. If you watch that film again and just think about the timeline of when everything is yeah. happening, we kind of intercut the birth of um, the football club with people going off to war. It, but they all happen in completely different years. Yeah. And, you know, but we didn't want it to be linear. But Ralph Turner's story is, is the only linear thing. All the way through. In the film, because we start off with him as a little boy. And it goes all the way through the war years and then it ends with him coming back. So he's kind of like the spine of the film and then we bounce back in time throughout hopefully in a way that's not confusing <laughs> and and how does a composer go about putting a score together for a movie like this a documentary like this because your score is absolutely beautiful over the top thank of this thank you so how how did you go about putting this together well we we sit down we sat down and we talked about scenes and what we wanted to encapsulate in the project what sort of uh, feel we wanted the, the film to have um, what sort of music in places and uh, as you have seen and it has sort of a variety of you know the quirkiness the yeah. emotional the deep emotional the action in terms of intensity not action packed as it were uh, but intensity so um, it was a conscious de decision in a way but uh, then it, everything fell into place according to what I was getting from Theo yeah. in terms of the scene so uh, you cannot in this project at least we didn't want to cautious personally I didn't want to overpower what was happening because we were telling a story and I was only enhancing the story yeah. or the visuals with the music it wasn't about the music you know be the prominent uh, having a prominent role but to enhance either the the visuals or the emotions or what we wanted to project in a way yeah. and we were bouncing ideas back and forth all the time you know he, he would write some he will edit something then I'll write something for that scene then I'll bounce the idea back he will go back and change the scene and then it will send it back again and I will readjust or sometimes I will write something and then he will go out and film something based on that piece of music so it was what we the pure sense of collaboration yeah. and bouncing of ideas which I personally found it wonderful because it was it didn't feel restricted or rigid in a way it was uh, it was flowing ever so nicely yeah and did you did you look to sort of like any other projects that may be out there that for a little bit of inspiration or was it just completely collaborating together and you just made it go well we we wanted again to uh, encapsulate a sound that it will depict the stories, for example, yeah. the Englishness, the Britishness of a sound, or for Williams or Elga, or these kind of sounds. Or when we had more intimate scenes in terms of sound, uh, to go more, I wouldn't call it minimal, but with the bare essentials to just put out, maybe it would just be a piano or a, a solo yeah. of a, a cello or something like that, that 
Um, I was going to say we, we try to be original. Yes, if you allow me the expression, we try to be as original as possible. Yeah. Uh, not to imitate or something that has sort of um, yeah, an imitation or it always sounds like that or it sounds like seeming something else. So yeah. we wanted to be as original and pure as possible. Well, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, one of the things I was interested in, because it, it is a documentary and, and I'm imagining you didn't have the, the biggest budget ever, we have some sort of footage of kind of early war days and things like that. Where, where did this footage come from? Um, do you mean sort of like when Ralph was going over? Yeah. So that was just... Because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming like you didn't film it yourself or reenact no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, that was just licensed. I mean, that was one of the... <coughs> I mean, the film, I was talking to someone earlier, if you considered my edit time, because I was editing pretty much solidly for two and a half years, you know, the budget would have gone yeah. Yeah. into like six figures easily. I mean, just easily. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I was able to do a lot. Of, I was, it was very much a DIY film, like film. I was able to do a lot of the filming myself, the editing. Um, I couldn't do the music. <laughs> I don't even think I paid Linda. Uh, this is a, an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was very much DIY. Um, um, but we had to pay for the, you have to pay for the footage that you license. Okay. We, we were able to use footage from the local area people, families that would have old cine film, like the footage of Biggles Road in and the Biggles 30s. Road. Yeah. There's footage of like little kids in in the thirties at yeah. s school sports days in black and yeah, white found running like along. A, um, local, from local people, local families. Yeah. 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 Let us have it. Just so, yeah. um, and of course, uh, one of the characters in the film, Malcolm Hanscom, he he's sort of photographic legacy. He spent from the forties onwards. He was taking his own photos, but before the war, he was. Um, restoring old negatives from the late 1800s Definitely. and reprinting them. So he was actually salvaging photos that were taken before he was born. So um, we, we had, I mean, oh, I mean Langford is just a crazy place when it comes to sort of archive, <laughs> isn't it? It's just, oh, and well, I, well, I imagine well, most well, places well. would be, if you yeah. scratched on yeah. the surface of any kind of, like where you're from in Scotland, if you asked around, you'd probably be like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be asking my lot. <laughs> I, I would hate to think what stories come out of our town. <laughs> Can I just say, just to sort of join the dots between Christos writing the music and yep. me talking about that scene mm -hmm. from 1953 that kept moving about, that was one of the last scenes Christos wrote music for. Right. Because he was like, Theo, I need to write music for this scene. And I was like, I don't know where it's going to go yet. <laughs> Would have really influenced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so beautiful, the scene and the music, and combined. Are we talking about the last scene of the? The very, course? very end when they get on the, yeah. they go over to Holland and they oh, surf the yeah, wrecks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so beautiful, and it's like it wouldn't have worked like three quarters of the way into the film, but it's got a real. But that was never at the end, was it originally? Because when I saw. It was somewhere, yeah, yeah. somewhere in the middle of it. I don't yeah, know. yeah, it was, it was a tricky, it was a, yeah, it was a really yeah. tricky... But that's right. Because, as I said, the film isn't just like, it starts in 1920s yeah. and it goes through to 1953 because we bounce around the eras a bit. So, so what's, what's been the reaction to the documentary, both from people at Langford, both from audiences around wherever you, uh, festivals you've been showing it? They just love it. They come up to me all the time, mainly because they know me. And <laughs> I just, I haven't heard anyone say they love it, especially that story at the end, the one that you were right to put that at the end. I think that's the one that touches everyone. Yeah. Yeah. They've loved it. I mean, we showed it was at the village hall, wasn't it? You put on. I love that. How many screenings? Yeah. So we knew a lot of the people. You did as well, didn't you? But some people didn't know Langford at all, and they come from quite a way and they all just came up to you and me and everyone just said wonderful and it made them cry and that was the plan. <laughs> it's emotional. This yeah. is how we're going to get them. I've got a village hall screening story for you. Um, I love it. 
So we finally got the film finished. It was about three years. Yeah, right? three years. Pandemic yeah. We yeah. finally got the film finished, and everyone in the village is like, "When is the film going to be done?" We're like, "I think it was um, Christmas 2020. Is would that be right or 2021?" Yeah, well, um, oh, no, 2020 was the pandemic year. Yeah, yes, I, so we came out 21. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we had to wait until Christmas 2021 because then it was kind of relaxing. Yeah. But some people were a bit nervous. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. a lot of people, like a lot of my close friends who still haven't seen the film, mm. who lived nearby said they, they're not going to come to the screening because they want to go and see their grandmother. Okay. Yeah, you know, you, you know, yeah, yeah. Vulnerable family members. You can so, understand. Um, so when we finally did get to screen the film that everyone in the village was waiting for for three years, it was kind of, it was wonderful, but it was tinged with, we can't fully, yeah, we can't fully like celebrate. Was there masks and the seats had to be? So yeah, we had the oh, seats spread, you down. know. So um, it's it's not a community it's cinema a experience, is it? But here's a little story about the, the Women's Institute in Langford. Right? All right. Ooh, right? <laughs> um, they contacted me and they said, ooh. Um, we always have the village hall on a Friday night and I see you want to do your screenings and it was like, yes, well, we won't do a screening on that night. And they were like, well, why can't you um, come down and present the film and screen it to us? So I was like, okay. And I went down there and there was like all these sort of dagger eyes looking at me. Because <laughs> after them, I don't think, realised there was a film being shown. Right. So they were like, why is this guy just sat in the corner? Because they all had their like tea and cakes first. <laughs> And then, like, the head WY woman got up and said, uh, he's here, there's a film. So, like, so, <laughs> with that, with and, that uh, much enthusiasm. <laughs> and what was brilliant, right, is um, one of the photos that was from about 1918, depicting, like, a bunch of people, this woman, who must have been about 92, was like, that's my great-grandmother. <laughs> It was brilliant. Wow. Yeah. So wow. these really old people were like looking at really old photos, and for you that must be a moment. That, that's a yeah. Moment. That that it's kind of a weird. It's a, it's kind of a weird. Yeah, with filmmaking you get loads of sort of um, wins and losses. Yeah, and the little things like that do sort of absolutely, stay absolutely for sure. I'm not entirely sure where we were. I, I was just kind of listening. <laughs> but, but, but I suppose on, on um, one question that I do like to ask is um, when we screen these movies up on the big screen and people come to see them and not, you've got the audience there, you guys are all there. And I ask the creators, the directors, the composers, uh, everyone like that, you can tell me a million and one things that's wrong with this documentary. A million and one things that's wrong up on that screen. What's the one thing that you're most proud of up on the screen when you watch it? All three. <laughs> I, I would say, and I'm sure I probably speak on behalf of all of us here, is the, the pride you get of having all that effort, teamwork effort, uh, being shown on the big screen. And not just because you will see your name, obviously that goes without saying, but the pride you get of the impact that the big screen gives you the atmosphere into the theatre um, obviously all of us coming from a generation that you experience the film in a theatre yeah. the sound the impact of the visuals so you hear all of that and you 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 absorb all of it and you you know you, you immerse into that world of the motion picture into a place that is meant to be for that uh, so I think that's the most at least for me uh, you know the, the proud moment that you hear your music into you know the big theater and it makes you know complements the visuals yeah. of that project and you think I think I did a good work there so, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go um, well I felt the most proud because I'm not in this business at all am I just to help you out you know, well I'm you are business. you're in it now <laughs> And um, we took a couple of friends on the first night, and they don't go out very much, and they're very, you know, and they said at the end of it, 
they stepped out into a fog, it was foggy that night, and they said that was like being in a magical world in there when we got lost and now we stepped out into this world and they loved it and they just and that's what it does, yeah. making a film. So that's the magic that we made and it was But you found the stories for them, so don't see yourself short. <laughs> I'm most proud of um, when I first met Ralph Turner. Right. Um, before I met him, he had contacted the Langford History Society. He was a president of, he's the president of everything in Langford. <laughs> um, he contacted the secretary, a lady called Rowena Wolfe, who is now, right. she, should, she should be here today, but she had a family mm. thing she couldn't get out of. Um, he, Ralph called Rowena and said, I'm a bit worried there's this young guy walking around the village asking <laughs> questions. Um, <laughs> and after meeting Ralph, I know, I, I love the story. It's like, yeah. you know, warms my heart hearing that. Because when we met, we became very close friends very quickly. Um, and every day when I'd get home from work, I'd stop off at his house and we would just talk and I'd put a little microphone. Yeah. I hadn't filmed him at this point. He agreed to help me with this video, as I called it. <laughs> okay. <And> video. <laughs> so he had his, his, he had his little chair that, he, as old people do, they always sit in yeah. the same chair. So I would, I'd say to him, you know, do you mind if I record you? And I made sure I had a good little audio recorder, microphone, I'd put it next to him. He'd be like, what do you want to know? <laughs> and I'd be like, just talk. Just talk right? Yeah. And he would talk a little bit about school, then he'd talk, I mean, a lot of it, you know, there was a lot of editing. I'll get back <laughs> to the editing of these audio recordings in a minute. He would go all over the place, but he would, he would kind of tell half stories. So he, he said a lot, but mm. a little bit about a lot. Right. Um, and then the day came when I bought my cameraman at the time, Jeff Mosley. He came up from London, he agreed to shoot everything for me. Um, Jeff came up, we interviewed Ralph, and again, he told a lot of, he spoke about a lot, but just little bits about a lot. Because um, my, my sort of interviewing technique, and it makes editing so difficult. <laughs> I'm an editor by I can relate, I can relate. And I would refuse to work with people who interview, like I interview people. Yeah. I just let people talk. And when they get a bit bored and they stop and they're like, oh, I've got my trailer of thought, you then ask them something. Yeah. So I had all these audio recordings and I had this one on camera interview um, and neither of the two were enough. And then he had a fall and his sons called me up and said, S I hadn't met them at this point. Again, like with Rowena from the History Society, mm -hmm. they are now like family and really close. Um, they said, that, you know, just leave our dad alone. He's had a fall, he's 96. I don't want you, he needs to rest. So yeah. I stayed away. And there's a bit of a sort of conflict of, uh, we had the momentum going, you know, I was building up. It's not like I was building up a friendship just to make the film. Yeah. You build up a friendship and then if you don't make the film, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you do, you got, to, you got them both. Um, and they were like, stay away from my dad, just give him some space, he's out of fall, he's 96. Um, and then a few weeks later, I'd call up and say, how's he doing? And then he sort of deteriorated and he had another fall and he ended up in Bedford Hospital. Mm. So my wife baked a cake. <laughs> and I drove to the hospital and I went to visit him. And it's kind of sad in a way that this guy who went over to the beaches of Normandy and had given so much to his village for so many decades. Yeah. He was kind of all alone. His sons would visit him. So I turned up and his face lit up. And <laughs> I gave him a cake. And we sat there and this nurse walked by and uh, i never forget, he looked up at her and he goes, we're making a video together. <laughs> I just thought that's such a lovely, you know, we're not shooting her. Ah. Shooting a feature, we're, we're just making the video. No, I like and that. And then he passed away, and then it was like, okay, the film's that's it for the film project. He, as soon as I'd met Ralph, I kind of knew he is going to be the main kind yeah. of contributor. So when he passed away, it was like, okay, I can't even bear load up 
you know, the edit computer and go through his interview yeah. like, like it's footage. Yeah, you know I, mean? I, I get like that, I get that. Someone I'd kind of really, really hit me It's hard. almost impersonal, isn't it? I said, you've got to do it. Yeah. You've got to finish it. So oh. then, then there was that, actually, Linda said it, my wife said it, Christos, everyone was like, you've got to do it for Ralph. Yeah. yeah. So the it's the best that, way to honour his memory. That the film is say, you know, showing at Romford, it's showing at Romford yeah. today. That's what I'm most proud of, is that we, we got our video made. Yeah. yeah, your video made. I love that. I do love that, by the way. So um, what's next? What, what are you working on next? Have you got anything you're actively looking into or is it just promote Langford right now? Mm. Well, as, as individual, it's, you know, with the nature of being uh, a composer, it could be any project at any time. It could yeah. be television, it could be uh, a, a, an advert that you ask, ask to write the music for or write additional music or music for a, a TV show or a TV film as such so but actively seeking to get on the next project to because you it's always the dread of how do I start it's always a blank yeah. canvas oh my god I cannot do this and you know, by the time you finished it you feel comfortable that you can't do it actually that and then when the next project comes is that you're panicking because you don't know how to start I mean it does I, I believe any uh, creative will uh, testify to that but as a as a collaborative uh, team here maybe I don't know something behind the scenes or how we got about it because like Theo said before this film was done at a very difficult time yeah of, you know like everyone was going you know and uh, it was in a way sadly saying uh, a sanity board for us to work give us a purpose to work on something but maybe at some point we we come up with something and said to people this is actually how we did it in terms this is what's yeah. happening behind the scenes it, it was a stressful period both getting the film done and in our actual lives yeah. that we're living through at the moment so maybe yeah i i will happily and gladly be on board um, when there is something else but that's down to the <laughs> creator to continue <laughs> the, the story or what was happening behind the Langford Tales yeah. stories. Maybe more tales about the tales. So. <laughs> <laughs> tales about the tales. <laughs> was that Langford to Tales about the tales? <laughs> <laughs> People were saying to me, oh, you've got to make, do like a little making of. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I've, I've got to because um, just like, you know, 15, 20 minutes, bit of sort of waffling on and you know just behind the scenes photographs <laughs> what have you just something quite simple and I was like okay I said to my wife I'm, I'm gonna do this the first thing I need to do is I need to you can actually download I think most of the time we spoke over the three years was via Facebook mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't via email or whatever it was always via Facebook so I discovered actually you can download yeah. an entire message history from yeah. one person into a single document yep. so I, I downloaded everything every back and forth with Christos and every back and forth with Linda that could get tricky by the way <laughs> <laughs> and this was from so from around like late 2018 yeah. when the idea was first seed was first grown and um, by the time I read through it or was just like exhausted I was like this is really dramatic stuff because I, I suddenly realised that we were filming the year leading up to the pandemic yeah. when the pandemic hit and throughout the pandemic mm -hmm. and once lockdown ended so I thought it would be such a waste to just make a making of so I've started doing some interviews with Rowena Wolf from the History Society various sort of people that were involved behind the scenes yeah. sort of key figures in the community that helped us make the film but in their own kind of unique way were yeah. really affected by the pandemic so it's kind of like um, the film's going to start off introducing these characters <laughs> who, this motley crew who yeah. came together decided to make a film so you think you're just watching a film about people making a film but then when the pandemic hits, yeah. you, it sort of spirals off into 
different stories. So. It's, like, it's that kind of um, the Terry Gilliam one, the Lost Lost in La Mancha. It's kind of like that. The the kind yeah. of the behind the scenes, what what could go wrong did go wrong, and you're kind of talking about the the drama behind it. Yeah. So um, so to kind of get away from the once in this new film when the pandemic does hit, to help break away, from, not get too fatigued by hearing lockdown, pandemic this, pandemic that, COVID this, COVID that. We can break away and talk about where we were yeah. at making the film. Do a bit turn, of reconstruction. Turn, so turns it to a positive, doesn't it? 1,200 photo, old photographs. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just do a nice little shoot of photographs being scanned, you know. Yeah. There'll be ways of making it engaging, but I think, again, that, w- that, could, I like be, that. that could be a nice way of documenting Absolutely. the pandemic in a different way. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's a different way of looking at the pandemic as well because we've got quite a lot of shots that are quite depressing <laughs> to do with the pandemic. <laughs> Not so much this year, but last year we got loads. <laughs> right, so um, I'm going to start wrapping it up. Uh, but, but thank you um, so much for, for submitting Langford Tales and for letting us show it. And thank you for being here today in person. That's absolutely fantastic. Doing this, you, you've already done a Q&A, so you'll be all talked out for the day. Uh, get yourselves to the bar and have a drink but um, if one last question and, and you could go to all three um, or yourself whatever what do you hope people take away audiences take away from Langford Tales when they walk out the cinema I don't know why this is not a hard question to answer because I know the answer <laughs> I, I don't, when people do hear you know when people see things like lest we forget or they hear roll calls yeah if they go past, if they drive past the war memorial, like Langford, you've only got to go one mile. You're in the next village. Yeah. There's a memorial with 40 names on it. You, you drive another mile. You're in another village. Every single village has got a war memorial. So if people drive past and see a war memorial, they don't even have to read the names. They can just see the engravings and they'll know take, that behind every. Take a second. Just think There's about a story it. Behind. Yeah. That's kind of what we wanted to do. That's definitely from the start. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to kind of zoom What's in the story on the, the on a man. Yeah. The families, and exactly. The village, and they all knew each other then as well. I think I think we've we've lost a lot of that over the years oh, yeah. with with the likes of social media and things like that. We we don't take a second to actually look back anymore. And I, and I think you're absolutely right what you're saying. Absolutely right, and and that should be the takeaway, definitely. No, I think there's that horrible quote by Joseph Stalin, like, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic, right? <laughs> I mean, it's an awful... Yeah, um, yeah because it becomes too much to... But, yeah. like, you know, it's, even today, in 2023, we've still got wars going on. Yeah, conflict, yeah, so yeah. People are desensitised to it in a way. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, hopefully we've sort of brought home how impactful... Yeah. For people to lose their uh, also, it's like it's at the base level, the the community level as well. So it's yeah, spot on, absolutely spot on. Um, I agree exactly the same. What you said. <laughs> well, echoing, echoing exactly what Theo just said. Is I'm I'm going to use one of the phrases from the documentary, which is uh, as simple as it sounds, uh, is very deep, and sometimes we take it for granted that those people at the age of 18, 19, 20 beats, some of them, they gave their then today for our tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't even think twice. They didn't even think, oh, maybe, maybe I know, maybe I won't go. Without even hesitation, they just went because they didn't even think, oh, I'm going to give my today because they will have, they, they put their lives on the line because they, they would, that's exactly what they wanted to do um, without any second thought and that should be taken away and be appreciated you know from not just the generations now for generations to feel yeah. that a lot of people they gave their time on their today then for hours to be able not even just watch the film but to carry on with uh, our lives and that's one very core cool thing to just take Absolutely. away and keep it could you imagine asking a 17 year old to do that now? <laughs> no, no, crack, crack on, crack on. Um, so make, making an independent film, right, when you haven't got sort of executive producers breathing down your neck saying you've got to get this music cue done by this date. Ah. 
you have to da 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 by this date. Um, it's really hard to keep the momentum going. Like, I'm sure everyone's had it in life. Yeah, I can imagine. Even if it's a garden laying a patio, you just think, oh my God, I don't have to do it, but oh, I've done half of it. <laughs> it's really difficult. So over that three years, there were times when I was just like, I just can't yeah. carry yeah. on, but but thinking about the boys, yeah. the stories we were telling that, and Ralph, of course, that was a big didn't complain a big kind of push, and there was a yeah. reminder that actually we're able, we got a luxury of being able to make a film. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. Sort of didn't you know they never grew up to hear Pink Floyd. They never grew up to get Netflix. They, you know, oh Netflix. You know, they're just so <laughs> much, so much they didn't, you know, it would have been no, with you music in that time, but, um, you know, it's a big inspiration. Absolutely. Film about people that didn't grow, get to grow old. And with that, we will uh, wrap this up. But uh, again, thank you for submitting the movie. Thank you for letting us show it. Thank you for being here. In a village, you damn village things. We couldn't go far, because you ain't got cars. So everything was done round Langford, really. Rex always played a mouth organ. Well, I suppose he did play other tunes. All I can remember is the Isle of Capri. He played that all the time. Uncle Malcolm had a strong sense of history. He took thousands of photographs over the years. One small group that have only recently come to light they do tell an extraordinary story. It does stir up things when you start thinking about it. What happened? I got up there just before 11 o'clock. Mr Chamberlain came on and gave them their good news. Six of us all went the same day. They mixed you up, they didn't keep you together. Basil was a very good footballer. Dear Mum and Dad, just a few lines to let you know I have arrived safely. He needn't have gone, but he chose to off his own back. He left the village and he joined the RAF. It was quite the biggest thrill of my life and I enjoyed every minute of it. There was nothing of which to be frightened. My mother came to say goodbye. She had tears in her eyes when the train left. It was a war. You knew it was a war, but it was what we were brought up in. I mean, you just got on with life. Me and my brother went up the tree, picked all these plums. That was one thing we'd done to help the soldiers, I suppose, in a war, you know. <laughs> <laughs>